Hello and welcome to Radio Spätkauf, the Berlin news show. We're recording live from the Comedy Cafe in Berlin. Uh, I'm Maisie, and with me tonight on stage are journalist Joe Dolroy. Dolroy. Good evening, Maisie. How are you doing? And comedian Daniel Stern. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. And also with us here tonight is the audience. Guys, give yourselves a round of applause yeah. for coming out. Come on. And uh, coming up on the show tonight, Joel. Uh, on tonight's show, Easter is almost here. We're going to be talking about a blacklist of 700 films that you're forbidden to watch on Good Friday. And we've got two special guests. Uh, Craig Schuften is coming on to talk about the Culture Club Kino. And Elizabeth Rush is going to give us a positive story about refu refugee athletes. But we're going to get on kick off with some public transport news. Yeah. So there's been some reports of fake controllers scamming passengers on the U-Bahn. Now, okay, just to clarify, these people are not actually passengers who are scamming the U-Bahn themselves. So anyway. <laughs> okay, right, right. <laughs> It's a uh, con on con there. All right. I, I, do, I do like the fact that we use like undercover agents to patrol the trains instead of just having, you know, a turnstile or something. So I, is, there, is there ever been, is there ever been like one who's just been in too deep? Like Serpico <laughs> just like started s stealing their own thing. So uh, the, the point of this, <laughs> I, I, I'm supposed to be reading the, the actual information here. Uh, so guys, next time your ticket is checked on the U-Bahn, make sure that you ask the inspectors for their ID. Uh, if they're an official, not person trying to steal your money from the Bay of Gay, they will have an ID with their photo and a service number on it. Whether or not it's possible to fake an ID, I don't know. <laughs> so we won't be able to verify that. But um, one thing that the Bay of Gay wanted to let people know is that if they're asking for cash, they're probably not legit. Uh, I will say that I have never not paid cash for not having, <laughs> like that has always been my way to go. Um, but uh, one good thing to know is if you are fine, that does operate as a ticket for the rest of your journey. So it's really not 40 bucks, it's only 3820. <laughs> not bad. 3830, they haven't put the prices up yet. 3730, <gasps> don't do maths on air. <laughs> Well, speaking of the uh, U-Bahn or the S-Bahn, uh, basically, if you're taking the U-Bahn from Alexanderplatz heading south, you may have noticed that the trains are running very slow uh, lately. And there's and a very, very good reason. reason for that. And the reason is that the tunnel is unexpectedly sinking into the ground. The 100-year-old tunnel has uh, sunk 5.6 centimeters in recent months. And that's because there's a new high-rise hotel being built right on top of it. Oh. Um, it's it's going to be a huge building. Um, and their you know, construction is actually affecting the tunnel. And in order to stabilize it, they're going to have to inject some special material under the tunnel. And uh, until the end of 2017, the U2 will be running very slowly. Uh, through that part. Hopefully, the whole tunnel doesn't completely collapse. So um, until September 2017, uh, take a book on the U2. There's the advice. Uh, there's been another street art stunt in the U-Bahn, uh, this time on the actual trains rather than in the tunnel itself. Right, yeah, you might remember on our last episode we talked about how uh, the Befalgi workers had found a bedroom, a secret bedroom that was um, uh, installed in a service tunnel, like a complete mobile, you know, with furniture and everything, and it was, an, it was decided it was an art stunt. Um, and this time someone's gone and stuck, uh, basically they put, I think, 27 different cameras inside an U-Bahn carriage, security cameras, and big posters saying video. So um, it's, I guess it's a protest about uh, observation or, or surveillance on the U-Bahn trains. Um, and uh, the papers are declaring now that, that installation art is the new graffiti in Berlin. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I think yeah. it's great. I think it's a great turn of events. More what's, installation art. Yeah. What's like the, the tag version of it? Like when people just start scrawling their name, what, what, well, you're the installation version. Yeah, so now it's just going to be gluing weird shit to the walls. More of it. Um, oh, amazing. Uh, have you noticed some new buses rolling around Berlin lately? They look better than they smell, apparently. Have, have you seen any of these buses? I think I got I almost hit by one the other day. <laughs> <laughs> but more on that later. Well, there's a problem with the new buses, and that is that they stink. Passengers are reporting various odors, including cat piss and rotting wow. flesh. 
leading to headaches and watery eyes. Now, the beer fowl has acknowledged that there is a smell that is released after a, um, a certain number of kilometres reached by these buses because they burn a bit of some sort of plastic. Um, but they say that there's no health damage <laughs> likely. Wow. Now, the Drivers Association is a bit sceptical of the tests that they did because they said that they did the tests with the doors open, which seems a little bit like cheating to me. Um, but there's uh, no plans to replace them. Apparently, 40 of the new 110 buses are affected. Uh, so take a peg for your nose if you take a bus. <laughs> I, like the, I like your descriptions. They sounded almost like really terrible wine. Like, oh, this bus has notes of a uh, dead animal and rotting, <laughs> rotting flesh. Now, regular listeners to Radio Spätkauf will know that we talk a lot about bicycles. And it's been pointed out to me that perhaps we're being a little bit unfair to the car drivers and we're not representing their views enough on this show. So I thought instead of bicycle news this time, we're going to have some automobile news. Uh, so our very first item about automobile news is uh, a piece about racing in the streets of Berlin. Yeah, we've had a uh, little uh, Fast and the Furious action lately. Um, illegal car races. Um, I mean... You know, like, uh, yes, yeah, sir. <clears throat> there have been uh, dozens of reports of high speed races, particularly in the West, um, with cars tearing down the streets at over 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, no, no information on how many miles per hour that is. Um, some have uh, resulted in nasty crashes, uh, like one on Tausendseinstrasse. That's, that's where uh, KDV is. Okay. Yeah. Main shopping street. Big car crash in front of KDV. Ta- uh, and uh, and uh, someone, uh, uh, a 69-year-old uh, man was actually killed by a passing car as a result of one of these races. So That, that one was a very unfortunate one. Um, it did result in a death. And it was very public because it was right in the middle of, as Maisie said, one in, um, right in front of Cardo. Fast and Furious, basically. Very, be- very public GTA. area. Yeah. The police have uh, announced that they're going to do some kind of crackdown. Um, and they have caught a few cars that have been racing around lately. But um, another car incident was that a bomb, car bomb blew up in West Berlin right near the Deutsche Opera. Yeah, and, and to be clear, this isn't like a, a scary terrorist car bomb. It's like a, it was a result of like a drug deal gone bad. That's right. Uh, so it's nothing to, you know, we're not, don't we're not get terrorized. Longer, unless you're a drug dealer. Uh, yeah. And then be very worried. This uh, could happen to you. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, apparently... Get you guys think cocaine is nothing but fun, but it can result in car blasts. And uh, I actually read today in the Bay Z that now there is a big complaint that they have not done an adequate job cleaning up after it. So that's fresh off the, pa- so the presses. That, that photo's from today, is it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The TV tax, Joel, my favourite subject, uh, yes, it's been found to be legal, which I'm very disappointed by, even for people who don't have a TV or a radio, like myself. Bad news, Maisie. Even though you don't have a TV or a radio, you've still got to pay the TV tax. Last week, Germany's uh, federal administrative court made a ruling about a challenge to the Rundfunkbeitrag, which is better known as the TV tax. Now, since 2013, every household in Germany has been, ha- has been forced to basically pay €17.50 Euros 50 a month for the Rundfunkbeitrag. Before that, you could avoid paying the tax by simply not answering the door when the inspectors came knocking. Um, I, I remember when I moved here, my first flatmate instructed me very carefully. It was the first thing he said, was, do not let the TV tax people in. Um, but in 2013, the system changed. They got wise about this, and they forced that uh, everybody was obliged to pay 1750 regardless of whether you had a TV or a radio in the house. Now, the argument was that you could actually access some content uh, online, so therefore everybody should have to pay. Um, there were several legal challenges mounted to this, this new ruling, um, basically saying that it was an illegal tax that was unfair, especially to those people without devices to watch the content. Uh, but this court, unfortunately, has ruled in favour of the TV networks, and they have decided they have to, you know, basically you have to pay. The complainants still have the option of appealing to the highest court in Karlsruhe, but that court has already ruled on several similar cases and has decided that, uh, has thrown those ones out. So there's not likely to be any more sympathetic to these complainants. Um, there's a second separate case about the TV tax going through the courts as well, which is regarding businesses having to pay it. I believe one of the, the droggery chains, Rossman, is complaining that they um, have to pay hundreds of thousands of euros every month because they have so many shops all over Germany, all of which have to pay the TV tax, even though they don't have make any use of uh, TV or radio in their stores. So we're all going to have to keep paying the bills. 
And basically, the only way you can get out of this is if you're on welfare, in which case the job centre gives you a piece of paper which you have to send in and then you, you don't have to pay. But even then, you're not entirely out of it because if you're on welfare but your housemate is not, then you still, the housemate still has to pay and presumably it would only be fair for you to chip mm. in half. Um, so the question is, of course, where does all this money go? Because that's an awful lot of money being paid every month. Well, it goes to the public television and radio services of Germany, which um, it's basically administered by the, the ARD, ZDF, and Deutschland Radio, and is then distributed down to all the regional radio and television stations. In Berlin, the one is called RBB. I think they're doing some really great work lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. In case you didn't know, Daniel was uh, filmed... <laughs> Last week by RBB for a, as a comedy sketch and uh, has his his followership has increased. Yeah, guys, pay your taxes. It's really important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really is. Yeah. So anyway, the German public broadcasters collectively rake in 8.32 billion annually, and just by comparison, the BBC in the UK, the annual budget there is 6.62 billion. So the German broadcasters are pulling in a lot more than the BBC, and I guess it's up for us all to decide whether we think they're doing as good a job. Um, we did post this story on Facebook and we got a very lively discussion going on Facebook because some people were very against it because as foreigners they have even less re uh, access to this information because it's all in German. Um, but then some people said that they're very happy to pay the tax because some of these stations do produce quality work and some of the money even gets put into film productions like the movie Citizen Four, which was a documentary about Edward Snowden that I believe won an Oscar for Best Documentary and that was partially funded by one of the regional TV stations using the TV tax money. So there's reasons for it. Did we all get thanked in the acceptance speech? <laughs> This is another point that people are sour about, about the TV tax as well, is that although there's a lot of fantastic content produced by these stations, they archive most of it. So after it's played on air, it gets locked away and you can never see it again. And um, there's a funny reason for that too that we don't have time to go into maybe another time, but you, you, you would think that if the public pays for something, it should be made available to the public. But We also pay for tanks and I'm not allowed to drive one, so maybe that doesn't hold up. Outrageous. The uh, refugee influx has created some b uh, big business for some well-connected people in Germany. There's a lot of public money being thrown around to house and protect refugees, or process refugees, I should say. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of business people out there who are willing to take advantage of it. So the state pays up to, I think it's 50 euros a night to house refugees. If they can't be housed in an asylum home or a centre, they often get put into hotels or hostels, and there's been reports of hostels cramming people in dozens to a room to make as much per head as they can. Um, and it's not just the shady small-time landlords. There's also very big companies who are getting their noses into the cash. And over the recent past weeks, a scandal has emerged in Berlin around a contract that was awarded to the huge global consulting company known as McKinsey. It all started off very nicely. Last year, McKinsey offered to help reorganize Berlin's chaotic refugee processing center, which is called Lageso which was really struggling to handle all the, uh, the new arrivals, which resulted in thousands of people standing out in the cold in Moabit um, in the middle of winter, just waiting to get an appointment. So McKinsey came in and offered to restructure the whole system, and they said they would do it for free as part of their social program. They sent five consultants in who were working at Lagasso, telling the uh, people there how to do their jobs better. Um, but it turns out at the same time that McKinsey somehow won a, master, a, a contract to create a master plan for integration and for this separate second contract they were going to get paid a quarter of a million euros. And not only that, but McKinsey had also hired a former SPD party apparatchik named Lutz Dival, who was a friend of the, the current mayor, um, Michael Muller, to work on this master plan and he got, he got paid uh, um, quite handsomely for that. So basically it looks like McKinsey cooked up a scheme to get a big contract by getting close to M SPD party members, offering a partially free service while actually getting a big fat contract in the background. And this has all been coming out in the media in the past few weeks and it's made the mayor Michael Muller look pretty bad. And due to the scandal last week, McKinsey cancelled both the free contract and the paid contract um, and said that they weren't happy with the bad image that they were getting. Nevertheless, the SPD consultant got paid 33,000 euros for 30 days work um, on the master plan. So that's pretty close to the average income for Germany for 30 days work. <laughs> and I wonder if he really did a year's worth of work in 30 days. I doubt it very much. It's a bit like the airport boss job, isn't it? They just get, you go in, get sacked, nice big fat payment, off you go. And it's the same thing, isn't it, basically? I feel like every month we just learn another way for to, that consultant is the greatest job ever. Consultant really is, I, I mean, I've worked with several consultants in my, my second life as a startup, and, you know, sometimes 
I, 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 I sometimes feel the minimum wage intern in the company does a fair bit more than the you know, 2,000 euro a day consultant. But you know, I guess you've got to jump through some hoops to get there and shake the right hands. Or by the looks of it, join the SPD and then you might have <laughs> a better chance in <laughs> Berlin. All right, so, so that was um, a bit of negative refugee news. And there's a lot of negative refugee news around at the moment. Um, but we want to balance it out because there are actually a lot of positive refugee stories too. And to tell us one of them, uh, we uh, invited on a special guest, a journalist Elizabeth Rush, who has written a very great positive story about refugees lately. And we want to get her on as a guest on Radio Spekhaus. So could you please welcome Elizabeth Rush to Radio Spekhaus. <laughs> So Elizabeth, welcome. Um, Thank you. you had a story this week in uh, about a, a very inspiring young young woman. Do you want to tell us a bit about yes. who she is? Uh, 18-year-old Isra Mardini is an athlete who fled the Syrian war last August. And um, she was already training for the Olympics. She's been swimming since she was three. So she's quite a high-level athlete. And um, when she left Syria, she left with her sister, <laughs> and part of their escape was uh, on a boat to the island of Lesbos, where the motor failed after five minutes. Um, so the girls jumped in the water and pushed the boat for three three hours to get what? to um, yeah to get to Lesbos. They made it to Berlin after 25 days uh, trekking across Europe in a group of refugees. Um, other incidents that they had were like uh, getting past the border of Serbia where they had to crawl through a cornfield and it took like six hours. If you had walked in plain sight it would have taken ten minutes but they were uh, hiding from the police and yeah so she has an amazing story and she is one of the most determined people I've ever met in my life and she's still full of smiles and right now she's um, in the 40, uh, she's in a group of 43 athletes who are being considered for the refugee Olympic team. Uh, they're going to pick five to ten athletes from this group. Um, so she'll find out in the next two months if she makes the cut. What's her, what's her uh, sport? What's her freestyle? Um, her event is the 200 meter uh, freestyle. And she's currently at two minutes and 11 seconds and she needs to get down to two minutes, three seconds. And she's, she's in a refugee camp, is she? Or she's, um, she's now living in Berlin with her parents and her sister. They made it all over. Um, she's got her passport and her papers, so she wants to live here. Um, she lives really close to the, the Olympia Stadion where she's uh, training. And are there more refugees who are training for the Olympics in Berlin? Is this just one? Or um, yeah, they do, she couldn't tell us who the other refugees were. Um, she could only talk about herself, and yeah, that was the only information that we had was about Isra. Um, yeah, she has a Facebook page, so if you look up Isra Mardini, you can track her progress and see how she's doing. So did she mention about how the whole process had affected her swimming, or does it seem like it's knocked any wind out of her sails, or is she more determined than ever? Uh, you would think that she would never want to get in the water again, but... Um, she said, uh, you know, when she gets in the pool, you can just forget about everything. And um, she never lost her, the whole, those 25 days she was trekking across Europe. All she could think about was getting to a swimming club and starting training again. So that's amazing. I and think it kept her going. And this refugee team, is it uh, going to be from athletes from all over the world or specifically from Europe and or from Germany? Um, we don't know. Right. Um, it'll be, yeah. They will be uh, just the team of refugee Olympic athletes. They will, um, their flag will be the Olympic flag. The, their, um, their anthem will be the Olympic anthem. So um, they, on paper, they don't have a country to represent, but they are the, the refugee Olympic team. Does that happen every Olympics? I can't remember. I'm trying to... I don't think so. My I memory of the opening ceremonies, if that's always yeah. been something. I, it's a, I, I think there, yeah, there is, there has, in, in, I don't know if it's every limit, there in the past been like athletes without a nation right. representing. I think there might be a Syrian team, of, but it's separate. Yeah. Yeah. She also mentioned that she wants to be an airline pilot, so maybe in the future. Wow. Big ambitions. After, she said after her Olympic career, <laughs> her next wow. goal is to be a pilot, so. That's so just to reiterate, her and her sister <laughs> pushed a boat yeah. full of refugees. So to actually, shore. they 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 were okay. Their whatever boat they were on first was um, blocked by the Turkish police, 
So they got on a rubber boat intended for six people, and there was 20 of them. Um, after a few minutes, the motor died, and they realized they were, her and her sister were the only... There was three swimmers on board, so... The three, three people who could, who could who could swim. swim. Oh yeah, um, water started coming in, so they jumped out and started pushing and swimming. And she said they took turns because it was cold. It was evening time. Um, it was really salty. She wears glasses, so she couldn't really even see. Um, and yeah, they made it. They could see the island. It was. It should have been 45 minutes, but yeah, it took them over three hours. Wow, that's an incredible story. And uh, where can people read this story, Elizabeth? Um, I, wrote f I wrote about Israel for Take Part. It's an uh, independent journalism website, takepart.com. But uh, we had a press day on Friday, and all of international press were there, The Guardian, uh, AP. So you can look up your favorite news platform, and you'll find <laughs> out about it. But my story is on Take Part. And it, it's a nice bit of uh, symbolism, I think, if she's basically training in the Olympic Stadium, which was built for the 1936 Olympics, yes. as a, yes. <laughs> a showpiece for the Aryan race, yes. um, I think that's quite a nice bit of irony. Yeah, yeah. totally. Uh, everyone was blown away by her um, just positive attitude, and you wouldn't think about what she had been through so recently. Yeah. So Elizabeth not only writes fantastic, positive, uplifting stories for <laughs> websites like Take Part, but she also has her own uh, Berlin podcast about food, which is called Berlin Belly. And uh, why don't you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, Berlin Belly is a personal project and uh, basically an excuse for me to talk to fun foodie people about what they do and talk to food makers and hear their food story and how they came to be opening Korean restaurants or making ice cream. Um, so yeah, it's every two weeks. Our most recent episode was with Gabrielle Jones from Jones Ice Cream, you might know, um, in Berlin. So yeah, it's kind of a storytelling. I like your, your one about the kimchi chef. It made me want to learn yeah. kimchi. How to make She's kimchi. amazing, and she came to Berlin as an opera singer, so you never know where your path is going to lead you. <laughs> Great, well thank you very much okay. for coming on, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. That was goosebumpy. Yeah, great story. So, uh, dear listeners, we're about to do something on Radio Spade Capital that we've never done before, which is to present a paid advertisement. And we just wanted to prepare you for that and make sure that you're all okay with it. And we're sure you will be. Joel, but don't apologize. I'm not apologizing. Yeah, don't apologize. You're this being apologetic. Okay, no yeah. apologies. It's been a long time Deal coming. with it. Come on. No, no. I'm just pointing out that, of course, uh, a lot of my favorite podcasts have paid advertising, and everyone knows there's cost involved in producing things and time, so I'm sure yeah, you all don't mind. And Joel, I'm using up what should be the most productive years of my life. Yeah, and quite frankly, we've been begging for advertising for some <laughs> years, so don't act all like, oh, <laughs> it's a bit of a surprise. Just, oh, like, he was just walking down the street yeah. oh. and they assaulted me. <laughs> they gave me money. So anyway, we finally found a company who's willing to give us some money <laughs> in order to help pay our costs. Wow. And we're about to present that ad, and we just wanted to let you know and make sure you're cool. Everyone are cool with that? Yeah, yeah we're cool with it. You've got to be, basically. Okay. And now, and now a word from our sponsors. So, Dan, have you been in any accidents lately? Uh, yeah, I had a near miss with a, a bus or two. <laughs> yeah, you did tell us last episode how you almost got in a fight with a bus. No, no, you, you, that was your stand-up bit, with wasn't a bus. it? Yeah, I think... <laughs> I, yeah, I fought, I fought a bus. Like, whatever. Like, took him on. It wasn't like a fair fight, and I don't see... But, yeah, the bus won... Um, well, look, anyway, bicycle season's coming up now, which means there's a prime time for potential accidents. That's right. So It's like one of my, my favorite, like, <laughs> signs of spring is, is, is people on the street going, It's not grounding! Like, that's, <laughs> oh, spring. It's like birds chirping. <laughs> bicycles. <laughs> Guys, we're trying to make, shh, trying to make money here. We're getting paid for this. <laughs> Yeah. Bicycle season is a prime accident time, so it's a good time to start thinking about getting what Germans call Haftpflichtversicherung, which is third-party liability insurance. And this is a special kind of insurance that covers you in case you damage somebody else's person or property. Um, and almost every German actually has this, and they think you're crazy if you don't have it. Now, if you're a uh, foreigner in Germany, of course, getting insurance can be very confusing, especially if you don't speak bureaucratic German. But thankfully, there's a, a company that is now offering third-party liability insurance with all their documentation in plain English. Everything from the sign-up form to the detailed policy is English, so you'll never get confused, even when you're filing a claim. The company is called Claire, and you'll find them at claire.de. That's C-L-A-R-E. 
Um, and they offer really affordable rates, just a few euros a month. Uh, there's, everything's very understandable, doesn't cost you much, and it protects you in case you do something stupid this summer. So visit Claire DE to sign up. And if you do do so, please make sure you heard about them on, you heard about them on Radio Spätkauf, so that way they'll keep supporting us in the future and uh, supporting this show to helping us bring you the news. So yeah. thank you, Claire. Yeah, guys. Good night. I'm like, live your lives irresponsibly. Yeah. I appreciate them. Go- hey, I want to read their, can I read their slogan? Hey, go on. Go on, yeah. Uh, in a bustling city like Berlin, you can expect the unexpected. You've got to watch out, Daniel. You know, we want to nice. keep Thanks, Claire. supporting us. All right, coming up on the show, Joel. So, the 1st of May is just around the corner, is it? Um, Basically, the revolutionary Esther Mai was previously known as the Day of Marches, protests and clashes between the police and the left or the anarchist scene. But in more recent years, the whole event has been successfully neutralised by turning it into basically a giant uh, street fest, a street party called My Fest, where 40,000 people can get drunk and eat bratwurst. So um, my fest is happening again this year, you'll be happy to know, or maybe not, but it's only after a few months of wrangling and contortions between the organisers and the police minister, Frank Henkel. So after last oh. year's festival, um, the police stripped my fest of its classification as a political demonstration. If something is classified as a political demonstration, it means that the police are automatically obliged to protect it. But the police decided at the end of, uh, end of the last event that they were going to take away that classification and therefore force somebody to have to pay for the security of the event, presumably having to pay the police themselves. Um, so the, no, nobody stepped forward with the money, so it looked like the event wasn't going to happen. But they can't just cancel a day. <laughs> just go, like, to start the month on two? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> So there was a breakthrough, and it didn't involve reorganising the calendar. Um, it, it was decided that the event would have to include more political content. So there's going to be more speeches and more political content at the event. So this seems to have kind of backfired against the police, who presumably don't want the left to have more of a, a platform to speak their views, but it had turned out that's going to be the case. So I don't know if they're intending to silence everybody, but they've kind of done the opposite. And my fest is still going to happen, and the police still have to protect it. Good work. So hey, unless someone really steps up and totally corporatizes the event, we have to then include more political speeches. That's and, right. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Unless they find a sponsor, yeah. <laughs> Shh, don't Claire's going to go do that yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, man. We need the money. Um, summer is on the way. Uh, is next spring and now summer is on the uh, way? Yeah. What? No, it was spring first and now it's summer, apparently. <laughs> both are on the way at the same time. Well, they are According both on the to way. you, Joel. Are we talking about yeah. the... This just in, now. the nature like, of time remains... Yeah, it's really like... Chronological. Uh, next Sunday is when you're going to have to change your clocks one hour forwards, so uh, 2 a.m. becomes 3 a.m. And uh, what I thought this was a good uh, time... <laughs> Someone just went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Well, you will be sad to know, audience member who yelled out positively, that the CDU, which is Angela Merkel's party, has actually got an official position um, of a, wanting to abolish the so-called Sommerzeit. Uh, someone's in favour of that. <laughs> oh, my God. We're going to have a fight in the audience. Um, so I, the, I this, this is our most controversial topic ever. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to be. <laughs> I thought the TV tax would get people talking, but no, it's Sommerzeit. So, yeah, basically the CDU don't want the, to uh, change the time at all, which is very typically conservative of them. Um, they... <laughs> Uh, but actually, they can't enact this diabolical plan to rob us of an extra hour of daylight because the European time zones are regulated in Brussels. So an institute recently did a study of the effects of daylight saving, and they found that there was absolutely no noticeable effect of any kind on the economy, the health, or the agriculture of any kind as a result of the, the summer night. So in fact, the only reason it does exist is for the pleasure of enjoying a long, light evening. <laughs> All right. Okay, to add to the confusion, Easter's coming up next weekend. So it's spring, <laughs> then it's Easter, then it's, it's summer. Um, and it's, in case you haven't been paying attention to the phases of the moon, which I, of course, do every day, um, it's, na- it's often reported that on Good Friday, uh, you're not allowed to dance, Joel, apparently, due to some ancient religious laws. Uh, but did you know that you're not allowed to watch certain films as well on that day? Uh, there's like a handful of holidays which you're not allowed, allowed to to dance um, or celebrate certain um, or pagan traditions, no blood. Okay, like moving your own. So yeah, on Good Friday, All Saints Volks Trauertag. Volks Trauertag. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. Um, Get it right, man. 
Bus und Betag, Penance Day, and also Toten Sonntag, the German Remembrance Sunday, you are not allowed to watch uh, this list of movies. Now, so I have a list of what was banned between 1980 and 2015. It's um, 700 different film. Um, although if you eliminate duplicates, it turns out, uh, according to someone on the internet, there are 666. Um, <laughs> Now, I assume that there was, like, uh, like the Pope was, like, watching movies and deciding which ones were allowed or not, but it's actually controlled by the, uh, the, the FSK, the, the same people that give you your ratings on your movies, the Freiwillige Selbstkontrolle der Filmwirtschaft. Um, so, um, it's not clear why some things do and don't make the cuts. Now, it's, they do many fewer, like, in 1980, there were 91 movies that got banned. In 2015, there were only four. So they're like not really as trigger happy with it used to be as they used to be. Um, pretty much any awesome action movie from the 80s is not allowed. Like no Predator, no Lost Boys, no RoboCop, no RoboCop 3, no Terminator, no Top Gun, Aliens, Highlander. Like those are out. Just, I think they're just cool. Uh, any, like most movies with a vampire, like that's, if you're trying to make a movie and you want it to be allowed to be watched on these days, vampire is a bad way to go. You know, no Blade, although Blade 2 and 3 are okay. And I'm, I have to say, I think Blade 3 is kind of under... Well, technically, it's called Blade Trinity, but I don't know. Um, they seem to have a thing against Dolph Lundgren. He had, like, three movies that were banned. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about. Um, you can't watch Down by Law, um, because I don't know. It's just kind of slow. <laughs> uh, also, also illegal is Harold and Maud and um, Mary Poppins. What? Oh, I'm, I mean, I've been trying to do the math. You, yes. you hate Mary Poppins? I hate that stuff. I uh, but do you think it should chitty, be banned? Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. S no, some Mary things make Poppins. sense. Like Get Life of Brian. Life of Brian, okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, if you like Jesus and don't like laughter, like I can see how that would be... <laughs> Like the decision you would make there. Um, a lot of horror movies get banned, although it's more likely if it's a remake. They seem to hate when you do that. Like good for them. Like, good for them. Yeah, like say. remakes of classic yeah, horror movies. Like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre had a remake. No way. Original, fine. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street, same deal. Um, Final Destination Five got banned, but one through four, yeah. It was just like <laughs> one too many. Um, I noticed all, all of the Police Academy movies also. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of Police Academy movies. I'm not sure all of them. There's, there's th a lot of those went straight to video. Are there, are there guidelines for how these yeah, are That's, what, I that's what I've been trying to determine. Like, I've been going arbitrary. through this list and trying to figure it out. And like, yeah, the vampire things, I guess like it's Jesus but, can be undead, but not... We're talking about movies that are like kids' movies, adult movies, horror movies, action movies. Predator and Mary Poppins. Any movie that somehow is against some, says something against religion is that maybe the the, the theme that's nope. running here what? I mean What's it's the anti-religious sentiment in Mary Poppins that's what I'm trying I know <laughs> like, there's like a pro-women's vote sentiment in Mary Poppins oh really and there's like a run on the bank sentiment in any but yeah like, I can't I, tell yeah. us Dan no I mean I, I found uh, there was and there's just like there's really no there's no rhyme or reason to any of it honestly it's it's totally insane I think there's probably something like a, a form you have to fill out to like be allowed not to, or and people just forget. <laughs> like that would be my best guess. I, that would make there, sense, wouldn't it? Or there's or just some there's bureaucrat. Somebody, if someone's got a job, someone's sitting there, and it's their job to actually TV, decide this. TV tax, TV <laughs> tax. That's where it's going. But um, I, it's also interesting to note that if you do screen these movies, they really do come and find you. So last year, there was a group in some little town who decided to, to test it out. They showed the life of Brian. They got a thousand euro fine. Yeah. So. But I feel like we there's like a we could do like a Footloose remake, but where we're showing the movie Footloose and that's illegal. Do you see what I did there? No. Okay, it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> no, I didn't get it. Let's keep going with the show. We've got another guest coming on the show tonight, um, and the guest is Mr. Craig Schufton. Please welcome him to Radio Spätkauf. Good evening, Craig. Good evening, Joel. Good evening, Macy. Good evening, Dan. Thank you for, thank you for having me. What a polite My guess. voice is terrible. <laughs> oh my, I quit. He's had a lot of practice. Don't okay, worry, don't okay. worry. So Craig is coming on the show today to tell us about a really fascinating event that he's putting on um, coming up this week, which is called the Culture Club Kino. 
Um, and this is going to be an amazing event at the Babylon in Mitte in the Oval Room. It's um, a live mashup of, of, of vision, of voice, of history, of art, of culture, all in one fantastic evening. But I thought maybe I'd love to get your spin on it first, Craig. Yeah, I mean, what I've, what I've been telling people about this is that it is, yeah, it's about the relationship between pop culture and history at large, you know, the history of ideas, the history of philosophy, the history of art and music, all of these things showing how they have influenced and shaped the pop culture that we consume today. I suppose, I suppose it's also a little bit like a, like a more entertaining university lecture with, a, accompanied by the kind of YouTube videos that you would watch at 4 a.m. when you're drunk with your friends, you know? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's, that's about as, about as, about as clearly, clearly as I can put it, yeah. So you basically, it's, fun, it's fun and good for you. You get up there, you present a whole bunch of really fascinating connections between all different bits of, in, of, of film and art and culture and how they all work together and you show videos and tell stories about how they all interact. Mm, yeah. um, what's the main theme going to be about? Well, this, for, this, for this very first one, it began with a, with a story that I found really interesting. I was doing some reading about the work of the film director, Tim Burton, who's, whose work I really like. Not so much the more recent stuff, but definitely his, his, his the early work, you know? Beetlejuice, yeah. the ba his Batman films. Hang on a second, Dan, is Beetlejuice on that, on that list of 700? You're allowed to watch Beetlejuice. Okay, what? So good, yeah. that's, that's got the undead all over it. Uh, I object no to this. That should not be shown at, at I feel, Easter. I feel like the, even the filmmaker would be disappointed to find that out. Right, he, he, he definitely would, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was reading a book of interviews with, with Tim Burton where he talked about you know, how and why he, he, he started making films. And, and he said that when he was a kid, you know, he... Um, he used to watch monster movies. That was his favorite thing, you know, growing up in, the, in a suburb of California through the, 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 the 60s and 70s. He would go to the drive-in, you know, he would stay up late and watch, the, watch the, the midnight monster movie. And he loved those things, you know. And he said one of his favorites was Godzilla. And what he really loved about this was imagining, like, like not identifying with the heroes and imagining that he was battling the monster, but imagining that he was the monster. He said he dreamed of being the person who got to wear the Godzilla suit and trample suburbia under his feet. And, the, and he went on to draw what I thought was a very interesting conclusion from that. He said, you know, all, people have often said that a lot of my films are about outsiders, and that's true, they are. Even his Batman is a kind of a, kind of a sociopath. Um, he said that, you know, he thinks his, his feelings of... of distaste for society and his feeling that he wanted to either run away from it as fast as he could or destroy it by any means possible were formed in those in those early years watching the drive-ins and he's not the only one who's in our who, who's basically been creating our culture who has this kind of uh, attachment or, or no. relationship to monsters and society no that's right i mean this you know this will come as no surprise to any of you the idea that the artist is kind of separate from from or in revolt against society you know that's probably the most boring thing that any artist could tell you isn't it <laughs> like like you know i'm a, i'm an outsider i don't feel like i belong and be like Really? You know? <laughs> Tell us something new. You know, that's yeah, yeah. So, um, but 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 it's interesting. You know, the this the, this idea of the artist as an essentially antisocial character has a long, long history, and it goes back to the Romantic movement, and it's it's very prominent in the Expressionist movement, particularly German German Expressionism. And the idea of this 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 first installment of Culture Club Kino was to tell this story, like to show the way this idea has travelled through history, the way it arrived into the work of, you know, into as an influence in the work of some somebody like Tim Burton, and the reason why we still like this idea today, we still consider it romantic, we still give these people jobs and go see their movies, you know, we, we still like this idea of the artist as an outsider, why? And tell me about the process of actually creating this, this event. You started this as a radio series in Australia, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. It was, it was, um, it was because I was working at, a, at, the, at the, the public broadcaster in Australia, which is called the ABC. I was working in particular for their, their youth network, which is called Triple J. It plays uh, alternative music and hip hop and electronic music for an audience, of, in theory, of people between the ages of 18 and 26. Um, and, and at that, you know, when I first started working there, and this was the, the very late 90s, I'd just recently graduated from art school so the only thing I really knew how to do was talk about art. And, and I, you know, I was working there and this friend of mine who was a producer, he said, oh, you know, we, we thought it would be great to have a, a little segment, a little thing, you know, five minutes a week where somebody came on and talked about the history of art and ideas for a young audience and made it interesting. And so that became my job every week. It was terrifying. <laughs> It really was. It was exciting but terrifying, you know, because I had to become an instant expert in something, whether it was like Gertrude Stein or, or Picasso or Expressionism or, or whatever, you know, what, like Modernism or the Bauhaus. Every week it had to be something, something new. And now you're legitimately an expert because you've actually written like three or four books about so 
a whole range of fantastic topics. So if anyone can tell us about the history of art and how it all interacts, it's you. So I'm going to be there. It's on Thursday, the 24th of March, which is this coming Thursday. Um, and uh, it'll be right before a Good Friday, so we can all get ready to watch those. Maybe we'll have a secret screening of, the, of one of your movies <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. But get along. We'll publish the details online, and we'll make sure you all know about it. Um, and thanks very much for coming and telling, telling us about it, Craig. Thanks for having me. Um, the latest official uh, property price statistics have been released and they confirm what we already know, rents are going up. Rents are indeed going up. The IBB, the Investitions Bank Berlin, uh, tells us that the average rent has increased by from €8.80 Euro square metre uh, to €10.99. Euros um, sorry, that's only in the district of Kreuzberg, which is actually one of the um, hottest districts at the moment. It's even far ahead of Charlottenburg. The cheapest place to live these days is Marzahn Hellersdorf at €5.76 a square metre, <laughs> if you don't mind living in a Plattenbau, of course. Um, the average cost of buying a flat has also gone up. The median price for purchasing a, property, uh, a, a, a living space in Berlin is now €350,000, which is 7.9% higher than the year before. But if you haven't noticed, we moved on to housing news very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Do we jump right in there from, cult, from, you know, the, from, from, from Tim Burton to housing prices? We have to do it. Sorry, Joel. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, and, but if you happen to, by the way, if you happen to leave Berlin and venture into any of the smaller cities of the former East Germany, you're probably likely to see a lot of those Plattenbau buildings around. There used to be a lot more of them. And that's because over the past uh, decade, the small cities of East Germany have been busy knocking down their not-so-loved concrete towers. Now they're starting to realise that that might not have been such a good idea. No, not so smart. Um, basically, if any of you have been in a Plattenbau or live in one, uh, they're actually not badly built. Uh, but for a long time, the last, I'd say, 25 years, uh, the government, the German government, has been financing the demolition of many of these buildings, particularly out in uh, Frankfurt Oder and the likes, where they just say, OK, there's not enough people living here. Fall of the wall, everyone goes west, there's too much accommodation, and we'll get rid of the Plattenbaus first, the prefab buildings built by the communists. Um, and now they're realising with all the influx of refugees and the growth in population that maybe it's not such a smart idea. Uh, and they're actually saving them. So basically they've spent one million euro demolishing them it's since 2000. One million? Oh, sorry, sorry, 10 million. Um, I've got my, my numbers wrong. Um, and basically it's been made, made massive headlines in the past that all these buildings would be torn down and no one kind of was really bothered by it. And now they're basically the money is going to go into... At least 32 towns in Brandenburg are going to renovate and basically re, kind of yeah, basically make these buildings livable again, uh, do the electrics up and stuff like that. I'm surprised that anyone ever thought it would be necessary. To, didn't I mean population growth? Didn't anyone look at the like global population growth and just figure out that eventually some of these people are going to try and get here and maybe we should have a place for them to live? Yeah, but I don't think something you could plan. I think basically like I've lived here for some time without wanting to sound like an old Berlin punk, Joel, <laughs> um, but. Um, you could never have predicted in 2007. Uh, I remember reading a magazine on the Virgin in flight. Virgin used to fly here very cheaply. <laughs> I'm really showing my age now. And basically, you'd read the magazine, don't buy property, don't buy it, don't do it, don't do it. And uh, now it's obviously the opposite. And no one could really predict it because Berlin was just a kind of noth nowheresville. Mm. Uh, there is one way to predict it. Any city I move to will it like quadruple it, the real estate values. Like it's if you, the Dan if anyone wants to, yeah, if you just, if you like want to go into real estate investment, just like follow me on Facebook. If I post that I'm moving, money is to be made wherever I'm going to. Really? Yeah. Maisie, do these buildings have asbestos issues? Um, well, basically, I think some of them do, but it's not, it's probably cheaper to actually basically renovate them than completely rebuild them. Uh, and they find that, I find that basically a lot of them, like there's a Mimi on Mimhadstrasse, yep. a very famous complex, um, and I used to semi-live in one of those and uh, my flatmate one day got out of the shower uh, touched a, a surface of a kind of I think it was a washing machine got an electric shock <laughs> kind of stood back called the house of Altung, and they just said don't touch anything <laughs> because the entire flat was live oh. and it was the wiring left over from the GDR but apart from that Amazing flat. <laughs> you get all the heating from underneath. Amazing double glazing. You can't hear the street outside. They're fantastic, by, especially by uh, non-German standards. So in other building news, um, there was a very big construction over the last few years in Berlin called the Mall of Berlin, yes. which we reported on Radio Spätkauf because they had some pretty terrible building practices there. <coughs> they em employed a lot of uh, workers from East Europe on very dodgy 
conditions and then failed to pay them. But it turns out that the Mall of Berlin is actually losing money. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, basically, the Mall of Berlin, MOB, as I'll call it, it describes itself as the perfect shopping experience. It opened in September 2014. It is Berlin's second biggest shopping centre. I think the first is Alexa, if I'm right. Um, it's not doing well at all. Like, don't look too happy. Uh, <laughs> but for those of you who aren't really familiar with it... Um, I have to say, the Mall of Berlin, M-O-B, uh, c- congratulations to anyone who got the job of coming up with that name, by the way, Mall <laughs> of Berlin. Uh, it's got to be the easiest money you've ever made in your life. Um, it's located on Leipziger Platz uh, in the former East, sandwiched between the Holocaust Memorial, Hitler's Bunker, lots of old Plattenbauten and Potsdamer Platz. So a lot of atmosphere, it's really <laughs> kicking off there. Um, and it's on the former site of the Wertheim department store, uh, which another positive site, it was, uh, used to be Europe's biggest shopping site and it was expropriated by the Nazis. Um, but the mall itself, it's a kind of jazzy mixture of high-end posh shops and your kind of standard stuff you get everywhere, the shopping malls, the Aldis and all that. I'm trying not to name anybody, but I've just done it. Um, and the store, owner, the store owners apparently have been going to newspapers. I don't know how they do it. Like they ring up the Berlin and Morgan Post, and they've been complaining that the rents are too high. Uh, it's about, on average, for an Einzelhändler, like a small business, uh, 80 euro per square meter rent. Per square, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and they're saying there's not enough cu- customers. Tourists, the only <laughs> tourists are the people who go there, you know, people like wandering in from the Holocaust Memorial. The first thing you want to do when you come in from there is buy yourself some upmarket tea, because I definitely feel that need when I'm thinking about the Holocaust. <laughs> um, and basically, they say the mall is just too big to get around. It's just, it's, it's unwieldy. Um, and it's just a bad area in general, because it's next to Potsdamer Platz. And who wants to go to Potsdamer Platz, quite frankly? Uh, now, I think this is such a load of rubbish because what kind of complaints are these? Like, they agreed to this when they moved in. They agreed to the rental costs. The location. Yep, they knew where they were. It's yeah. like, oh, shit, I'm on Leipziger Platz. Oh, no, <laughs> this wasn't part of the deal. Uh, and they must have done some market research regarding the customers who would be primarily tourists. Um, and the dimensions of the mall, you kind of know what you're getting into. It's like, I'll rent this space in this building. It's like, oh, no, it's too big. So you're saying oh, the no. complaints by the shopkeepers yeah, are, it's are like, empty. I've got very limited sympathy for them. Right. And uh, I think basically the centre management's keeping stum. They're just waiting for the profits to rise. Um, I think the empty mall of Berlin, an empty mall of Berlin, of course I'm jubling, I'm celebrating, because I like, I like failures in Berlin. Um, <laughs> But basically, Berlin's always been famous for big, empty buildings. Right, uh, right. Palace de République. Uh, we need to basically keep this tradition alive. You and I more, think more future ruins. It's in the spirit of a ru- yeah, future ruins. So you're rooting against the MOB. By the way, oh, I yeah. didn't know we could call it the MOB. MOB. That's super cool. MOB. Uh, yeah. W- watch their umsatz. Watch their profits rise now with that tag. Um, but I think basically we could do something like the Palace de République umnutzung. Uh, we could flood it like we did that, um, get Einstutz and Neubauten to do a gig, start drilling into some pillars, put on the Berlin Festival. Are they not lacking a venue at the moment? They are. They're, they're, or turn it into refugee accommodation. Refugee accommodation, that's what we Which do. is, I think, is the best one. Now, I understand that Daniel is yeah, actually. A counterpoint this mall. Uh, the uh, mall is awesome. <laughs> but you're American. I mean, yeah, but like, I can Sorry. look. I, I grew up in like with you know with like several generations of like independent business owners. wasn't raised to enjoy malls. This is something I really participated in as a child, where I was like, ah, malls bad, whatever. But have you been to the Mall of Berlin? I mean, it is glorious. <laughs> Got this. Look how this shirt, Mall of Berlin, ten euro a week, and it's like the best place. Like it's where I go to celebrate my favorite holiday, uh, Shopping Sunday. Shopping Sunday. <laughs> How many it's times does that happen a year? Eight or nine. <laughs> more, than, more than Christmas. So that's, it's, it's, it's also like, uh, it's a, it's a, it is an indoor communal public space where people can go with old people, families, you know? It's, uh, I saw a lovely jazz concert there. Did you? Yes, not on purpose. <laughs> you but it was, it. I mean. Were you lost, wandering around it? Well, Air Berlin lost my parents' luggage, so we went there, and there was a jazz concert, and it was a beautiful moment. But, but that's, that's an American worth time, is it not? Well, like hanging out in malls. I don't know. I mean, sure, but we can't. We celebrate. You know, Berlin's an international city with uh, where where the traditions of all peoples are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Even my weird country. But I think, I think my problem with them all is, like, it's a bit, like, ill-conceived, like Potsdamer Platz was. It's just like, okay, well, here we have some land. 
it's the former East, but who cares what anyone's earning around here? Let's just build it. Let's just do it. Well, and it doesn't work. I'm not sure way. what I'm more against, the Mall of Berlin or the Stadtschloss. I, the kind of <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Well, they're, they're both basically big malls anyway. Well, mm-hmm. I, think, I think that it's in the, as a uh, diversity. I think in the name of diversity that we should support the MOB. Well, you've supported it with 10 MLB. euros. If, you, if more <laughs> shops oh. keep it, if more shoppers keep it. I also bought a Froyo, so that was like five bucks. <laughs> oh. No one likes me. Uh, In city council news, uh, the Berlin Senate wants to launch a pilot project allowing inmates in Berlin uh, prisons controlled access to the internet. Yes, uh, the idea is basically, until now, uh, access to the internet has been forbidden in German prisons and many worldwide. Uh, And there's a new program which they're going to launch, a two-year pilot program, which will contribute to the re-socialization, apparently, of uh, prisoners in Berlin. Uh, and they will have access, uh, limited access, to selected online sites, so approved sites. Okay. So the way to re-socialize is to engage in like YouTube commenting. Well, it's just like you know, Vice isn't going to be on there. Uh, what is going to be Build on there? Build won't be on there. But it's things like Wikipedia are okay, Google Maps. But I can think of all kinds of people like coming up with these clever ideas to get around it, like special. Oh, search someone's going to find a way around that. Yeah, for sure. totally. You know what? It sounds quite similar to something else actually that uh, Facebook tried to introduce in India recently. They tried to create like this free service for Indian people, but it was only going to be Facebook basically. It would let you let free internet access as long as it was whatever internet sites Facebook wanted you to. And the internet, uh, the Indian government ended up saying no thanks. But it looks like Berlin prisons are all in favour of it. So. They certainly are. Um, and the local council and state elections are scheduled to take place on September 18th. Uh, but there's now concern that the Bürgeramt won't be ready in time. Well, you might remember a few weeks ago we reported that the Bürgeramt had shut down for a few days to install some new software which was supposed to speed up your address registrations. And it unfortunately resulted in a 20% decrease in the number of registrations they could process. Well, that same computer system is now under scrutiny because a crucial component is not working. That would be the component that processes voter registrations, which are different from your housing registrations. Um, a test found that it failed to save data and doesn't print out registration forms. And now the <laughs> Landeswahlamt, which is the regional election office, says that at this point it does not appear the city will be ready in time for the September 18 vote to be able to take place. Now, the city leaders are playing down all these concerns, and a spokesperson said that there was plenty enough time between now and then to make sure everything was working. But what I really liked is how this, the Berliner Zeitung report, reported this story. At the end of the story, right after that quote from the spokesman, they just had one line which said, uh, Und in Zweithausen Siebsen eröffnet der BER. Or, and in 2017, the BER airport will open. Like, <laughs> That's amazing. Just how cynical could it be? Like, it, just, just to make the point that, you know, it, obviously this paper doesn't believe it's going to happen at all. Um, so on that should note, we do should we do an update on the airport? Uh, uh, I think yep. This is going to be our last story, <laughs> our major story of the night. And because we're going to be talking about the airport, and I know everyone is sick to death of hearing about how the airport is late. But in the last few weeks, there have been some news stories that have come around. And as you know, the podcast of record, we have to tell you about them. Um, but. What I thought I would do is try and cram all the airport news down into 30 seconds. 30 seconds? 30 seconds. So Daniel (coughs) is going to time while I do the fastest ever BER update on Radio Speaker. Ready? I'll do like, should I do on your mark, get set? Yep. Okay. On your mark, get set. Go. There are fresh doubts about whether the BER airport can open on time at the end of 2017 is scheduled. Now there are new problems with the fire and safety ventilation system. The airport managers failed to submit all the correct documentation to receive building permission. However, the mayor, Michael Muller, has denied this will cause delays and insists it will open on time. A report found that there are an average of 376 workers on the construction site each day, which is just 43% of the required workforce. Concern was raised that it would not be possible to relocate the heavy equipment from Tegel to BER in the winter due to the frost. But the airport boss, Carsten Mulfeld, said this would not be a problem due to global warming. (laughs) Okay, I meant a minute. I'm going to keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Such a despot, Joel. In another development, Mr. Munfeld unexpectedly cancelled a rental contract between the federal government, which has been leasing an old DDR airport terminal at Schoenefeld, as the Regierungs Terminal, the government airport. Um, they cancelled the contract, and as a result, they will have to build an entirely new third airport next to the <laughs> BER to house the government jets. This, this is because the Mayor Michael Muller ruled out the option of keeping the old Tegel Airport open to house the government airport because he doesn't want problems uh, with the neighbours. Meanwhile, the FDP party has started a petition to keep Tegel open and received 20,000 signatures, the first step towards a referendum. 
Done. Yeah. Yay. But why, why is the FTP behind that? Sorry. I keep doing it. <laughs> um, before we go, some thanks. Yeah, it's almost, we're about to wrap up here, so we're going to thank a few people. Yes, thank you very much to the Comedy Cafe of Berlin, this wonderful venue, thank for you, hosting Comedy us. Cafe Berlin. And thanks very much to our guests, uh, Craig, Craig Schuften and Elizabeth Ruscher. Um, thanks, that, guys. That's Rush. Rush, sorry. I'm pronouncing it German style. And thank you very much to our videographer and our projectionist, Joshua James, at the back there. Yeah. Alas, alas, I'm oh, sorry, of uh, Mobile Kino. And I've got one other thanks, which is uh, to uh, Mr. Oh, Brent Farrell from Nottingham, who wrote in to tell us that he binge listened to every single one of our 68 episodes going back to 2012. Oh. That's amazing. Yeah, it he was a, he, 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 he must have a, heard some embarrassing Yeah, Brent, thanks there. for the letter. It was really nice. Yeah. Send us a very nice email. It was a it was. very big email. Yeah. And yeah, so if you've also binge listened to every one of our episodes, please write in. We'd love to know what um, mistakes you heard or what contradictions or what bits of news we keep repeating over and over again. <laughs> and then last of all, thank you to our sponsor, Claire.de. Go and check out the website if you're looking for Haftpflichtversicherung in English, third-party insurance in English. So that's the end of our show. Thanks very much. It's been great chatting with you, Dan and Maisie. <laughs> all right, Joel. We'll see you next month. Yeah, hey, thanks for coming out, guys. Thanks. Thank you, Shreem.